Thanks to all of you for coming uh, on, this, uh, on this day to hear about St. Patrick. And I know there are many Irish Americans uh, in the room, not all of you, of course, but, uh, but many of you. And so let me start off by offending uh, just about everybody and saying that Patrick was not Irish. Uh, he, he was by uh, adoption. Uh, he, 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 he became Irish, which is, uh, which is almost as good, uh, of course. Uh, but uh, of all the stories you were brought up with about St. Patrick, uh, probably most of them aren't true. Uh, I hate to tell you that, the, the story about that. Well, we'll get to the snakes and the shamrock later. Uh, but uh, I, I, what I want to do today is tell you really a story that's even better uh, than the one you may have heard, the, the true story. Uh, about St. Patrick, this absolutely fascinating man uh, who I first read uh, about when I was in graduate school at Harvard uh, and, and heard about uh, him as a historical source, but then I became very much interested in him as a religious figure. Uh, and so today I want to share with you some of the things that I have found out uh, about uh, this man we know as St. Patrick. One of the most fascinating things about Patrick is that we know about him through documents that he himself left us that have survived. At least copies of these documents have survived. Uh, we know an awful lot about Alexander the Great, about, uh, about a number of figures from the ancient world, but what, they, what we know about them did not come from their own pen. Uh, Socrates, even Jesus, uh, did not write anything that survives. But Patrick wrote two letters in Latin as an old man at the end of the 5th century. And these letters, uh, the originals were lost, uh, of course, uh, pretty much everything was, uh, originals always were. But the copies of the copies of the copies have survived. And you can go and see the oldest copy of one of these letters today. I'm sure some of you have been to Trinity College in Dublin. Uh, you've been to the Book of Kells exhibit. You've stood in line for 45 minutes or an hour or whatever uh, it takes to finally get in. Uh, and then you, when you get in there and, you, and, and all the tourists crowd around the case with the Book of Kells, which is justly celebrated, it's so beautiful, look over in the corner. There's another little case there that hardly anybody ever goes to, and that's the Book of Armagh. And the Book of Armagh contains, among other things, uh, the Confession of St. Patrick, this confessio, this declaration uh, that was written by Patrick himself. This is a, a picture of it here. Uh, Ego Patricius Sum, I am Patrick. Uh, he says, uh, Peccatus Sum, I am a sinner. It's a just absolutely wonderful document. Uh, and it's so rare to, to have anything like this survive from the ancient world, and it's especially rare to have something that reveals the inner nature, the inner struggle of a man, uh, like Patrick's two short letters. We have Augustine's Confessions, of course, and they are remarkable, but almost everything we have from the ancient world that's written by anybody, I, I guess it's human nature, but we try to put our best face forward. Well, Patrick doesn't. Uh, he presents himself as he really was with all of his struggles, with all of his faults, uh, in these two wonderful letters. And it's, so it's from these two letters that we really know everything uh, that we know for certain about Patrick. And they are the source uh, that uh, historians draw on. Well, let's talk a little bit about the Roman Empire because who was St. Patrick? He was a Roman. Uh, he was a Roman citizen. Uh, he was uh, very proud in, in his letters. He says, Romanus sum, I am a Roman. He lived, he was born about the year 400 A.D., as far uh, as we can tell. It's a little bit of guesswork, but, but that's about the right time. He's living at the end of the Roman Empire in the West. So just about at the time where it's starting to collapse and to fade away. Patrick is living in the uh, far northwestern corner in the Roman province of Britain. And you can look at this map of the Roman Empire. Those of you who over here might not be able to see it so well. Take my word for it. Uh, it's, uh, it covered almost all of Europe, North Africa, the Near East. But it didn't, notice what it didn't cover in, in, the, in the upper left-hand corner, Ireland. Uh, the Romans never conquered Ireland. They thought about it. Uh, they considered it. Uh, the, the Roman uh, general Agricola wrote that he could do it with just a single legion, but the emperors had other things to do, and so Ireland was left uh, alone by the Romans. And so it was outside of the boundaries of civilization. This is the Roman province of Britain, and it's got uh, Ireland on there well, uh, as well. This is where uh, Patrick lived. 
Uh, this is where he was born, uh, at least. We don't know exactly where in Britain he was born. Now, I want you to understand, and, and, and please notice I'm emphasizing British. I, had, I gave a talk like this one time, and then uh, somebody uh, wrote that St. Patrick was English. He was not English. Uh, he was British. Uh, he was a, a Roman citizen of, of Britain. Uh, and he had to have lived somewhere there on the western coast because of what happened to him later uh, when, he was, uh, when he was kidnapped. So he's living somewhere, I don't know, in Wales, in, 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 in western Scotland. We really don't know uh, exactly. Somewhere south of Hadrian's Wall. Uh, and he's living in a, in a very civilized place. Britain had been conquered by the Romans um, three, four centuries earlier than this uh, under the Emperor Claudius. And so it was just as civilized as anywhere else in the empire. And so Patrick uh, grew up uh, in, this, um, in this culture, in this very civilized world. It was also a world of Christianity. Christianity had arrived in Britain Hard to say exactly when, maybe 200 A.D., nobody's really sure, but it had been there for a while. Uh, it, if you go uh, to Britain, uh, you can see some of the wonderful mosaics there uh, in the villas. Uh, and the, the villas uh, were owned, some of them, by Christians. Uh, and so you can see uh, images of, of Christ here with the Cairo symbol uh, behind him. Uh, but Christianity, even when Patrick was alive, even about the year 400 A.D. or so, was still a minority religion. Uh, there were um, old Roman uh, religions, there were Celtic religions that were still very popular, uh, but Christianity was present, uh, Christianity was there. Uh, Patrick actually was the grandson of a priest, uh, Potitus was his, his grandfather's name. Uh, his father was a deacon of the church, so Patrick came from a, a, a religious, um, a, a, a well-established Christian family. But we know from his letters that Patrick says, I wanted nothing to do with it. I wanted nothing to do with religion. And so from a young time, I became, uh, when I, even when I was a young child, I decided that I was going to be an atheist. So Patrick is a teenager. Uh, he's a Roman. He's an atheist. He's living in Britain uh, and living a, a, a pretty happy life. He's living in uh, a villa, uh, a very nice place. Very, I, I, I visited the, the ruins of some of these and they are absolutely gorgeous. Uh, Patrick grew up in a villa. He said he grew up in a villa near the town of Bonaventa Berni, I wish nobody knows where it is, but it must have been a very nice place, uh, full of luxuries, full of slaves uh, to wait on him. Uh, it must have been a quite remarkable life. But then one day the pirates came. Well, probably not quite like uh, this. Uh, and I guarantee they weren't nearly as nice uh, as, as the pirates of the Caribbean. But Patrick uh, says in his letters that he was living in his villa one day. His parents uh, apparently were not there. Uh, they were in town. Uh, but he was there one day when the Irish pirates came and raided uh, his villa. He says uh, they killed a number of the people there. Pirates were businessmen. Uh, they only wanted slaves that they could make money from. And so they took uh, the young men, uh, they took uh, the women, um, old people they killed, uh, pe children who were too young, uh, they didn't want them either. So it was a brutal, uh, shocking uh, awakening for Patrick to be pulled from a life of absolute luxury uh, and then thrown and chained and thrown into the bottom of a boat and rowed across the Irish Sea to be sold as a slave. Well, this is the image that Patrick had of the Irish. This is the image that most people had of the Irish. Uh, they were wild, crazy barbarians uh, who uh, the, the Romans had, had written about them. A few of them had actually visited Ireland. They said they were cannibals. Uh, they had no moral guidance in their lives. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily believe any of that. Uh, they were, uh, well, they were uh, uncivilized from a Roman point of view, of course. But uh, they uh, actually, the, the Irish had... Um, an amazing civilized culture from, um, from, from the Roman point of view, not from technology or anything like that, uh, but they had quite an elaborate system of laws. Uh, the rights of women were uh, remarkably uh, well-preserved. 
Uh, they had uh, bards who sang, uh, who told stories. Uh, they had uh, druids who were astronomers. It was a, a, a quite remarkable culture, but uh, it wasn't very civilized from a Roman point of view. And so you can imagine that Patrick, when he's at the bottom of that boat, being rowed across the Irish Sea, it must have taken several days to get back to Ireland. He had, uh, to get to Ireland, he had every reason to be absolutely terrified of what was going to happen to him when he landed there. Well, he lands in Ireland and he says that he was sold as a slave uh, to a, uh, a man who put him to work as a shepherd. And maybe some of you have spent more time around sheep than I have, but from my experiences with sheep, it's not really that much fun. Uh, they don't cooperate. As long as they're, they're, you're doing, they're doing what they want to do, it's fine. Uh, but uh, if you try to make sheep do things, it gets very unpleasant. Well, uh, Patrick uh, spent seven years as a slave. So from the time he was about 16 uh, into his early 20s, he works uh, as a slave. He says he worked through the snow and the rain and the cold. Uh, and it was an absolutely miserable life. Well, he had uh, no one to turn to uh, except in the moment of his distress, in the time of his distress, he remembered his childhood faith. And he rediscovered Christianity. And he began to pray. He says that he prayed sometimes a hundred times during a night and a hundred times during a day. Uh, he, he apparently picked up the name Holy Boy uh, from uh, some of the others, uh, other slaves. Uh, but Patrick had uh, a deep and true religious conversion at this time. So he spends seven years. He remembers his childhood stories. He remembers the gospel stories. He remembers the stories of uh, the exodus, the escape uh, from bondage in the land of Egypt. He remembers all these stories, but he has no hope at all of ever escaping because nobody escaped Ireland. We have no records of anybody who had ever escaped from Ireland as a slave and gotten back home again. Well, until Patrick came along, anyway. Uh, Patrick had a, a, a dream. Uh, he had several dreams. And in these dreams, he heard the voice of God saying to him, Patrick, your ship is ready. It's time to go home. And so Patrick wakes up and he looks around. And he's, he, he, he didn't know if this was real or not. So he goes back to sleep. And he says he heard the voice in the dream again. And he said that, it, he says, your ship is ready, the voice in the, in the dream said. And he said the ship was 200 miles away. Well, I know a lot of you have been to Ireland. It's not that big of, an, of, of a place. Uh, so 200 miles is pretty much the length of the island. That's 200 Roman miles, which is slightly less uh, than, uh, than, than 200 uh, uh, standard miles. Uh, so Patrick, wherever he was, and we really don't know, and of course there are different places in Ireland that claim Patrick, uh, that, that he worked as a shepherd there and that he uh, later worked uh, as, a, as a missionary there and that he was buried there. We really don't know any of those things for certain. But wherever Patrick was, he had to travel the entire length of Ireland, uh, of Ireland to get to this ship that God had told him was ready. And once he leaves, he is marked for death. Uh, he is an escaped slave. The, the, the Irish did not put up uh, with people running away from bondage. And so he, somehow he, he does this, though. He makes his way across the bogs and mountains of Ireland, uh, and he reaches the ship at the coast. My best guess, <coughs> excuse me, is he's working up north, uh, and he makes it down maybe around Cork, somewhere uh, around there in the south. I'm not really sure. Well, he arrives at this ship. And it's full of merchants slash pirates. Uh, there really wasn't a whole lot of difference uh, among, uh, among the Irish merchants. Uh, but he uh, arrives at this uh, ship, which has a cargo on it of Irish wolfhounds uh, that are being taken over to the Roman Empire. The, the Romans love Irish wolfhounds. Uh, that's something I, I bet you didn't know. Uh, they, uh, they, they love these dogs because uh, we have some records that they uh, were used in, um, in, 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 in the games, uh, in, Col in the Colosseum. Uh, they, they used these dogs. And they were just very popular because if you've seen Irish wolfhounds, they're enormous. Uh, they, they couldn't believe this. Uh, so uh, uh, Patrick uh, arrives at this place. Uh, the merchants, uh, he says, please, can I come with you? And they say, no probably because they had a lot of dogs on board, they didn't have room. Uh, but uh, So Patrick is, is so distressed at this point, he doesn't know what to do. Uh, he goes away, he prays, and then finally they call him back and they say, we changed our mind, you can come with us. And so Patrick does. <coughs> he makes his way back home. 
which nobody had ever done before. Nobody had ever escaped from slavery in Ireland. And he, he makes it back home. His parents uh, are, of course, thrilled to see him. They assumed he was dead uh, seven years before. And he settles into his old life. But how can you settle into your old life after you've been through an experience like that? One night when he's sleeping, he hears a voice, the same voice, and it says to him, Patrick, come back to Ireland. And he goes to sleep again. He shakes his head and says, no. And he hears this voice again and again in his dreams until he finally says, okay, I will go back to Ireland. I will go back to the people who treated me so badly. But first he has to get some training. So he goes to seminary, maybe not at the University of Chicago Divinity School, I don't know. Uh, but he goes somewhere, uh, probably to York or London or, or maybe to, uh, to Gaul, uh, and he gets training, he gets ordained as a deacon, he gets ordained as a priest, eventually he's be, going to be uh, ordained as a bishop. And after this religious training, however long it took, and we're really not quite sure, he goes back to Ireland. But he, to work in Ireland, <coughs> excuse me, I'm at the tail end of a cold, uh, to, to work in Ireland uh, it was not the same as working within the Roman Empire. Uh, Ireland had no cities at all, uh, and all it had were tribes. There were maybe 150 different tribes, each of them absolutely independent, and each of them ruled over by a king, like this guy here. Uh, the kings fought with each other all the time, and you could not move from one tribe to another unless you were a member of the nobility, uh, if you were a druid, if you were a bard, uh, if you were a blacksmith, uh, you, could, you could also do this, but you had to be a special person. The only people who could move freely around Ireland were that special noble class or if you were accompanied by one of them. And so Patrick begins his missionary work in Ireland and he does something that's going to get him in trouble with the bishops back in Britain uh, a little bit later. He offers gifts to the kings of Ireland in order to move from tribe to tribe, in order to get that escort that he needs. He has to offer gifts. He has to offer treasure to the different kings. Uh, and so he does this. He, he has to find a new way to work. And so he moves from tribe to tribe. He works with the different kings. Uh, and eventually, he, over a number of decades, he spreads the gospel uh, where he worked, probably in the north, probably in the area of, uh, from Armagh over to Donegal, uh, best guess. Uh, but he, he has to develop really a very new kind of missionary work, something that the Roman trained bishops were not at all sure about. And he has to work with Druids. Patrick never mentions Druids anywhere in his two letters. The Druids were the religious um, priests of the pre-Christian religion of Ireland, not just Ireland, uh, Britain, Gaul, uh, any uh, of the Celtic lands. Uh, so the Druids, apparently, though, uh, you don't hear stories uh, of, of, of reliable stories, anyway, of, of martyrdom. Certainly Patrick had some hard times and he faced some difficulties. But we don't know that the Druids actually persecuted Patrick in any particular way. There's some wonderful later stories of Patrick getting in battles, uh, uh, like the prophet Elijah with the Druids. And, and they're, they're, they're wonderful stories, and they're very colorful, but there's nothing like that in his letters. Patrick, Patrick's missionary work in Ireland was accomplished through a lot of faith and a lot of very hard work uh, over a long period of time. There are no miracles uh, in, his, in his story. Uh, it's just uh, an awful lot of hard work. Well, uh, shamrocks. Uh, did Patrick use the shamrock to preach the Trinity to the Irish? I wouldn't be surprised if he did. I mean, it's a natural sort of thing. You have the, 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 the three leaves of the clover. Uh, you have the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Uh, three leaves, one plant. It's a natural fit. Uh, it's a sort of thing you know, that, that I think he would have done, but we don't have any record that Patrick ever did this. Uh, this is a story that came along centuries later uh, about him. But having read the letters of Patrick, having thought about this man for a long time, it seems like exactly the sort of thing he would have done. So I wouldn't be surprised if that story is true, uh, though we don't have any record of it. But his, his work, um, his, his theology, if you're wondering about the theology of Patrick, uh, sometimes you hear stories that Patrick was influenced by the Druids uh, and that he preached a different kind of Christianity, uh, something sort of a, a mixture of Druidism and Christianity. 
There's nothing like that in his letters uh, at all. He gives a, um, a, a version of what he believes, which is basically the Nicene Creed. Uh, and so there's nothing exotic about Patrick's Christianity uh, at all. It, it, is, it is fifth century Catholic Christianity, plain and simple. Patrick lives and works in Ireland for many years, and when he's an old man, uh, he is baptizing the children and the grandchildren uh, of those that he had converted uh, long ago. But something terrible happened when Patrick was an old man, and when this happened, sometime at the latter part of the 5th century, we don't really know when, but we know it was around the time of Easter, when Patrick, uh, he had just finished baptizing a new group of converts, and uh, there was a raid from Britain this time. It's a reversal of fortunes. Uh, that, that There is a raid from a British king, a British tyrant called Caroticus. Now by this time the Roman Empire had collapsed in Britain. Uh, and what had previously been ruled, uh, Britain previously had been ruled by a governor, now it was ruled by a bunch of petty tyrants, little kings. Not all that different from Ireland in a lot of ways. Uh, but one of these named Caroticus sends a slave raiding party over to Ireland captures a bunch of slaves, kills some of them, and they just happen to be this group of newly converted Christians uh, that had uh, been, been converted by Patrick. Well, they're taken back to Britain, uh, and Patrick is naturally distraught, upset. Uh, he doesn't know exactly what to do, but he immediately writes a letter to Caroticus, and he says, what you have done is unchristian, terribly, terribly unchristian. Please send them back. Caroticus laughs at him. So after that, he writes uh, the letter that we do have, uh, the short letter called the Letter to the Soldiers of Caroticus. It's a, a, a scathing uh, letter of anger and excommunication. Imagine the, the most fiery sermon you have ever heard. Uh, it doesn't hold a candle uh, to this. Patrick is so angry at Caroticus, and it's, it's a masterful letter, too. If you want to read uh, about um, how somebody... Is, is just naturally skilled at, at, at rhetorical uh, and, and um, abilities, and naturally skilled at, at being able to twist and turn. It's just, it, it's great. I, it's in the back of my book. That's what I'll tell you. So you can read it there. It's in, you can find it on the internet too, for that matter. But it, it's, it's a wonderful letter, uh, and he really holds Caroticus's feet over the fire. Um, did it work? We don't know. Uh, we don't know if it worked at all, but it, it survives, and it's a, uh, it just, it's wonderful. Well, he got in trouble at that point. And we don't know for certain. I think that it's because of that letter that he got in trouble with the bishops of Britain. Uh, that was the final straw. He had been in trouble with them for a long time because of his, his, his different methods of missionary work. Uh, there was some question about, you know, should he be spending the money uh, bribing kings? Uh, you know, was that really appropriate? The bishops had never liked that. But when Patrick writes a letter as a bishop in Ireland two British subjects uh, who are under, uh, under another bishop, and he, and he criticizes them, excommunicates them, really. The bishops of Britain get very upset with Patrick. And so they say, they write him a letter, and they say, Patrick, come back to Britain. We're going to put you on trial. Patrick says, no, I won't go. Uh, and that is where we have the confessio, the confession, the longer of the two letters. And that is where Patrick explains who he is, where he came from, why he did all of the work in Ireland that he did, the difficulties he went through. He talks about his own faults, his own failings. He says that he committed a sin when he was 15 years old. This is one of the reasons the bishops um, want to bring him back for trial, is because they find out about this. This is just before he's kidnapped uh, and, and goes to Ireland. Uh, this, this sin was apparently so bad uh, that it got him in trouble 50 years later uh, with the bishops. And we don't know what it was. Uh, it, you can just have so much fun speculating about this, uh, about what this horrible sin was. But uh, Patrick says, I'm guilty, I did it, uh, but you know, I, I, I still want to work here in Ireland. Uh, it's just, uh, again, uh, like the letter to the soldiers of Caroticus, it's a wonderful view, it's a wonderful window into this, uh, this man and this age. We have nothing like it from the 5th century, or really from antiquity at all. So Patrick writes his confessio, his, his declaration, uh, and he talks to the, the British bishops. He says, I'm not going to go. Uh, did they drag him back? Did they make him come back? Well, we don't know. Uh, I don't think so. Patrick says, 
that what he wants more than anything is to die in Ireland among his own people, uh, among the Irish, uh, is, is what he most of all desires. This is one of Patrick's uh, burial places. Uh, there are several in Ireland that you can visit. Uh, we don't know where he's buried. Uh, we really don't. I'm sorry if that upsets anyone, uh, but uh, we, we really don't. And it really doesn't matter uh, because Patrick said, you know, I would much rather have my body given to the dogs to be, uh, to be, to be eaten. Uh, Patrick would not have wanted to be remembered in celebrations or, or, or probably even in pilgrimages. Uh, he was a very humble man. Uh, and uh, you can go to Ireland, you can uh, climb Crowpatrick, uh, which again, Patrick probably didn't do. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, it doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't matter. Uh, the, the real Patrick uh, is uh, the, the story that we get from his letters, uh, I guarantee. And all, I'm not putting down any of the later legends or any of the later uh, pilgrimages or anything else. They're all wonderful. They all, all have great spiritual merit. Uh, but uh, I would uh, recommend, in addition to those, uh, to consider the, the, the historical Patrick uh, that we can get uh, from the letters. So what would Patrick have made of St. Patrick's Day? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, the snakes. Yeah. Um, if any, I don't know how many of you have, I know a number of you have been to Ireland. Have any of you been to the Museum of Natural History? The one with the stuffed animals. It's, it, it, nobody goes there. Hardly anybody goes there. It's, it's behind Parliament building. Uh, but go there sometime and look for, it has all of the native animals of Ireland, but there are no snakes there. And that's not because Patrick drove them out. There were never any snakes in Ireland. I'm sorry, uh, there never were. It's a later legend that comes along many centuries afterwards. And of course, snakes, ever since the book of Genesis and the Epic of Gilgamesh, have been getting a bad rap. Uh, they are blamed, they are the symbols of evil. Uh, and that's, that's what the story is about Patrick. Uh, Patrick drives the snakes out of Ireland. He's really driving evil. He's driving the old pagan ways out of Ireland. It's a symbol. Well, uh, Patrick really, I I'm sure, would have been quite shocked uh, about St. Patrick's Day uh, and about uh, some of the celebrations uh, that take place. Um, and as, uh, as Alderman Burke mentioned, uh, in, including here in Chicago, uh, as Alderman Burke mentioned, the, the, um, it was the immigrants, uh, the Irish immigrants to America that really well, invented St. Patrick's Day as we know it. It was always a religious holiday in Ireland. You, you would always go to Mass on St. Patrick's Day and, and remember the saint, but, but it, it was never that big a deal, really. Uh, it was only here, uh, St. Patrick's Day was invented in Chicago and in Boston and in New York uh, by Irish immigrants who were proud of their, their homeland and wanted to remember and wanted to celebrate it. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's a great idea. Uh, and, of course, then everybody picked it up uh, you know, after that, uh, even Scandinavians uh, in my little hometown of Decorah, Iowa, all put on green hats and uh, all of that to march around on, on St. Patrick's Day. But uh, the, the, the real man um, behind, the, behind the story, and that's all great, and that's all great fun, and I enjoy it as much as anybody, but it's the, uh, uh, the real story, uh, the real man uh, that I find... Uh, the most fascinating, the real St. Patrick. Thank you very much.